Hey YouTube, so a lot of debates in philosophy revolve around the question of whether or not particular claims are true. So uh, realists about a given domain will tend to affirm that there can be truths with respect to that domain. So a, a moral realist will say that uh, there are moral truths, right? Slavery is wrong, is true. Um, whereas anti-realists with, with respect to a given domain will be much more suspicious of talk of truth. Um, so what I want to do in this video is talk about uh, a problem which maybe undermines uh, a lot of these debates. Uh, maybe the question of whether or not a particular proposition is true is uh, not as substantial or maybe even not as meaningful as we might initially have thought. Um, okay, so I'll begin with an illustration. I think colour provides a nice illustration. So our kind of common sense, intuitive, uh, ordinary way of thinking about colour, um, arguably treats colour as an objective property of the surfaces of objects. I mean, at least that seems to be how colour is presented in perception, or that's how we ordinarily talk about colours, right? So I, I kind of open my eyes and I see various objects around me and it seems like the colour is just built into the surfaces of those objects. I'm just detecting a property of the surface of those objects. Um, so I look at the cup in front of me, the cup is white, and the whiteness of the cup seems to be something, you know, out there in the world itself. Um, it's not, you know, it's not in here. It's not like an emotion, right? Like uh, if I see a bear at the window, okay, I'm, I, I experience fear, but the fear is kind of inside, right? The colour of the bear, the brownness of the bear um, is in the bear itself, right? That's how we just, you know, that's that's the sort of common sense or ordinary unreflective picture of colour, the naive picture of colour. Now, of course, it turns out that this naive picture is very difficult to sustain. Um, when one looks at colour science, the situation is much more complicated. I mean, um, for one thing, uh, the colours that I perceive, well, that's dependent on the specific functioning of the human visual system. Different species perceive different colours. Um, the colours that, uh, that I perceive are also going to be highly context dependent. So if I sort of change the uh, the, the environment around in the right sort of way, then I can make the white cup appear black, um, or I can make it appear red uh, if I use different lighting, or if I put different objects around it. Um, and just in general, I mean, it looks like there are no, like, if I, if I take the class of things that appear white to me, there isn't really any specific thing that they have in common, um, you know, at least with respect to the uh, the kind of structure of the surface. I mean, some of them don't even have surfaces, right? Like the sky. Um, so, yeah, anyway, um, the point is, is that our naive picture of colour seems to be false in many ways. It seems to be wrong. And so one natural reaction to this is to say, oh, OK, well, it turns out there are no colours. Um, all colour judgments are false, right? When I say that the cup is white, that's false. When I say that grass is green, that's false. Um, because actually there are no properties that play the the colour role. Um, and okay, that is a position that some philosophers have endorsed. Uh, but, you know, there are more conciliatory positions as well. So one thing we could say is, well, look, yeah, I mean, there aren't colours in exactly the sense that the naive picture of the world suggests. Um, but there are still regularities in how ordinary human perceivers respond to objects, right? I mean, so when we say that grass is green, well, maybe that's like grass is green. That proposition is true because uh, grass appears a particular way to uh, ordinary observers under ordinary conditions, where, of course, what counts as an ordinary observer is going to be uh, fixed with reference to the, like, most of the human population. I mean, for somebody who's red-green colorblind, yeah, we run into problems, but, like, you know, put those cases aside. Um, so there are regularities in how the, like, ordinary human visual system responds to things in the world, and that makes claims about colour true. So there are truths about colour. Now granted, this way of thinking about colour does not capture everything in the naive picture of colour, right? This idea of there being like 
objective properties of the surfaces of objects that are just immediately revealed in perception. Okay, maybe that doesn't work. But, um, you know, we have a way, like what, what you get from color science is this kind of picture which like gives us enough of what is in the naive picture to say that there really are colors. Um, now, the key point to notice about this is, so we have these sort of two positions where on the one hand, you know, somebody says, um, okay, there just are no colors and our ordinary claims about color turn out to be false. Color is an illusion. Um, and then on the other hand, we have people who say, no, there are colors, but colors turn out to be kind of different to what we expected. Um, and so, you know, we, yeah, we don't get everything that we thought we got, but we got, we get enough. Uh, we get enough of the naive picture to be able to say that there really are colors. The thing to notice, of course, is that this disagreement is not a disagreement about what's going on in the world. Um, I mean, it may well be the case that the uh, representatives of these two positions agree completely about color science. They agree completely about, you know, what the properties of the surfaces of objects are and about how the human visual system functions and all of this. The disagreement is about whether or not this suffices to make claims about color true. That's it. That's what the disagreement is. Um, one person says, no, that's not enough. The claims aren't true. The other person says, ah, well, it is enough. So the claims are true. But I mean, a natural reaction to that is, well, who really cares? Who really cares whether we say uh, that they're not strict? Like, we have one person saying, okay, these color claims are not strictly speaking true. Another person says, no, they are strictly speaking true. But actually, they agree on everything about the way the world is. So who cares whether we call them true? So basically, I mean, like, it, let's say we take the proposition grass is green, right? There's two interpretations of this. We could say that grass is green is literally false, but it's a very useful falsehood. Um... And it's, it's used to implicate things which are true. So, you know, if we, just, if we just take the sort of semantics of it, right, what it actually means, yeah, it's false. There isn't really any such thing as greenness, okay? It turns out colour is an illusion, but it's still a very useful way of classifying things, and we can use these claims about colour, um, yeah, we can use these claims about colour to sort of communicate things about the way that humans tend to classify things, the way that ordinary humans under certain types of conditions tend to classify objects. So, yeah, you know, grass doesn't literally have the property of greenness, but if I observe grass under such and such conditions, I can expect to have a certain type of visual experience or something like that. Um, so this is one sort of view. It's literally false, but it's useful. Um, on the other hand, we have the view that grass is green is literally true. And what makes it true is precisely the same things as what makes it useful on the uh, on the alternative interpretation. Um, so that, that like on on this second interpretation, it's it's actually true and it's made true by the fact that like ordinary observers have these sorts of experiences under such and such conditions. That's enough for its truth. And I think that you know so this so so okay. The, the point is then, is that um, we have these like different standards for what's required for truth. And that's what seems to be driving the debate between these two positions. And I think you can find um, similar sorts of debates elsewhere. I mean, this comes up in, in metaethics with respect to uh, moral naturalism versus moral error theory. So on the one hand, you have moral naturalists who will say that uh, moral properties reduced to natural properties. So, um, you know, maybe, for instance, goodness is is just pleasure, or maybe goodness is a matter of, you know, what would satisfy people's desires if they were to have, you know, full information or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, the worry is, is that naturalism isn't going to capture certain things that we really want out of morality. It doesn't give you categorical reasons, for instance. Re so, like, a moral naturalist is not... If you say that moral properties are natural properties, well, natural properties don't seem to provide reasons for action that are independent of our desires and goals. They don't seem to provide categorical reasons. Um, but the naturalist 
can say, well, you know, so what? I mean, it, the vast majority of people have similar sorts of goals insofar as the vast majority of people, you know, they want pleasure, they want peace, they want prosperity. Terms like good and bad tend to track what achieves such goals. So, yeah, I mean, you know, this framing of m moral properties as natural properties, that doesn't capture everything that is in our naive picture of morality, but it captures enough. Um, on the other hand, an error theorist will say, no, it doesn't capture enough. <laughs> so we have some people saying that moral claims are true and they're made true by natural properties. Some people saying, no, moral claims are all false. Uh, but actually there's like, where is the disagreement? Do they disagree on anything about, you know, the way the world is? Uh, <clears throat> so what's, again, what's driving the disagreement is different standards with respect to truth. I was a bit brief in explaining that, but uh, I have lots of videos on meta-ethics, so if you want more information, you can go and watch that. Hopefully you get the point. Um, I think the point is fairly straightforward. So, okay, now here's, here's the problem. There's this really nice um, article by a guy called Ollie Risberg, I think, uh, called Meta-Skepticism, and he talks in that article about how there are, there are many different knowledge-like concepts. So... The general point is, is that for any concept we use, there are going to be a variety of closely related concepts that we could have used instead. And he talks about the concept of knowledge. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that knowledge is justified true belief. So S knows that P, just in case S has, you know, S believes that P, um, P is true, and S has justification for her belief that P, right? Let's just suppose that that is the correct analysis of knowledge. Well, the thing is, is that clearly there are various other concepts that are very much like this concept. And we could have used those concepts. So, um, for instance, there's, you know, JTB plus, right? So we might, we, th there's another concept which would say um, S kind of knows plus uh, that P, if and only if. Uh, S believes that P, P is true, S has justification for P, and P was not inferred from a falsehood. Um, so this would be the no false lemmas view of knowledge. Um, and of course, in in epistemology, you know, you get this debate between uh, people who, who hold the standard justified true belief account and people who hold the justified true belief plus no false lemmas account. But put that debate aside, right, regardless of which of these concepts is our concept, um, the point is we have these two concepts and, you know, maybe our concept is JTB, but it could have been JTB plus, um, or it could have been some other concept, right? There are other concepts of knowledge. So there's a kind of causal concept of knowledge, which is uh, S knows that P, if and only if S has a belief that was caused by the fact that P. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of other concepts as well. So we have various different knowledge-like concepts. And I mean, so Risberg's article, as I said, was talking about knowledge and he sort of raises this challenge of, well, um, like what's so special about our concept of knowledge? Well, I mean, it seems to me there's a very similar point that one could make about truth, um, that there are, just as there are many different knowledge-like concepts, there are many different truth-like concepts. Um, so we have a bunch of different theories of truth. Uh, there's, you know, correspondence theories, coherence theories, pragmatist theories, deflationary theories. And what all of these theories are trying to do is they're trying to analyze our concept of truth. But you don't, it, you know, instead of, again, you can put aside the question of what our concept of truth actually is. What we have is a bunch of different truth-like concepts that are on the table. And, you know, our truth concept is close to these but you know it's not gonna you know may, maybe maybe our truth concept is a correspondence concept but we could have used a different concept instead um and in fact you know this is going to apply even if you take one specific theory of truth so let's take the correspondence theory let's say that um you know the ordinary ordinary concept of truth is correspondence so p is true just in case P matches the states of affairs in the world. P is true just in case P corresponds to the facts. So like grass is green is true just in case it corresponds to the fact that grass is green. Okay, so let's say we go for correspondence theory. We're looking for a match between the proposition and the world. But now 
what degree of matching is required? Um, I mean, we might have high standards or low standards for a match. And on, you know, if we have like, so we have this proposition that grass is green and that has a particular meaning. And then the idea is, is like this, you know, this is, this is going to be true if it matches what's going on in the world. But it seems like whether or not it matches what's going on in the world might well depend on whether our standards for a match are high or low. So like, I mean, if you take um, two pictures, you know, I could show you a picture of Frank Zappa in color, and then I could show you another picture of Frank Zappa in black and white. And I might say, well, do these pictures match? And, you know, if you're looking for like if they have to have the exact same properties, then you'd say, oh no, well, they don't match because one's in color and one's in black and white. So, you know, no match. But maybe we have lower standards. You know, maybe we say, well, all that's required for a match is that there's like similar patterns or similar things being represented, in which case you'd say, yeah, that one picture matches the other. So basically it's the same with like propositions in the world. Um, if we have a lower standard for what counts as a match, then more propositions are going to come out as being true. Um, indeed, if the standards are low enough, then even kind of what seem like obvious metaphors might turn out to be literally true. So let's say that, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I end up, I, I, I'm in a social situation, I say something really embarrassing, and I'm just like, oh God, I was, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about it later, and I'm like, I'm so embarrassed, I wished I was dead. Um, well, we would naturally, you know, naturally say, okay, that's not literally true. I didn't literally wish I was dead. But if we are lax enough about what counts as a match, then why not? I mean, um, the state that I was in, so the idea would be the state that I was in when I felt really embarrassed uh, is a very negative state. You know, I had this like negative emotion. And yeah, I mean, that actually does match the state of wishing that one was dead. Um, so in that case, if you have a low enough standard for what counts as a match, because again, we have two states which, you know, they're similar, right? They have certain similarities. The similarity is, is that, okay, we have one state where I, I felt this embarrassment. That's a very negative state. I didn't want to feel that way. Then you have another state of wishing that one is dead. Uh, wishing that one is dead is, again, a very negative state. You don't want to feel that way. You want things to... You sort of... Okay, when I was in... When I was feeling the embarrassment, like, I wanted the situation to end. Similarly, if you wish that you're dead, you want the situation to end. So, if the standards for a match are low enough, then it looks like... I was so embarrassed, I wished I was dead, is going to come out as being literally true. Like, it's not even a metaphor. It, it's, not, it's not metaphorically true. It is literally true that the state I was in uh, is a state of wishing that one is dead because it's, it's close enough, right? Um, so the proposition, I wished I was dead, is, is close enough of a match to that state of wishing one's death. Um, Okay, so, so the point of all of this is, um, we have all of these different, like various different concepts of truth, um, and, and kind of within those different concepts, again, they can kind of be broken down even further, and you know, we maybe have like high standards or low standards or whatever. Um, so here's sort of, sort of two questions, right? The first question is, well, what's so special about our concept of truth? I mean, if I, you know, if I, if I sort of engage in some philosophical analysis and I, and I can show that, like, I have an argument to the effect that grass is green is not true because there is no object, like, colour is not an objective property of the surfaces of objects. Okay, well, that argument has to be appealing to some concept of truth. But then what's so special about that concept? Um, and a, 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 another issue here, which is maybe a bit deeper, is just, why suppose that there even is any determinate concept of truth in play in the first place? So <clears throat> maybe our ordinary everyday concept of truth just doesn't distinguish between all of these various truth-like concepts. Maybe it's just indeterminate. Um, so I think that, you know, philosophical reflection often starts with just ordinary thinking. You know, we, we begin philosophical reflection with the sort of beliefs and principles and thoughts that we just happen to find ourselves with. And then 
you know, we, so I, I have various beliefs about the world. And then I say, OK, but is this justified? Does this count as knowledge? You know, I sort of step back. I think philosophy often involves this kind of stepping back from our practices and reflecting on those practices and asking, OK, what are the foundations of those practices? Does it, you know, do the beliefs involved in those practices make sense, etc.? But that's what philosophy is, right? So philosophy is in some sense a kind of, well, it's an unnatural sort of activity, right? Like it's not, you don't start with philosophy. You kind of just start acting and thinking and then you reflect. Um, but so, so OK, we, we, we start off with these ordinary ordinary practices, ordinary concepts. I say something like grass is green. You know, I learn in school that grass is green. Um, and, and then I can reflect on this. I can say, well, is that really true? Is it really true that grass is green? Is there such a thing as greenness? Um, and I mean, when I, when I ask this question of, is it true that grass is green? It, it looks like I'm using the concept of truth in the ordinary sense. Um, you know, if you told me that, well, you know, it's not true that grass is green, but what I mean by truth is some technical philosophical notion of truth that you've never cared about before. Well, that wouldn't really be a very satisfying answer. It's like, no, I, I want to know whether it's true that grass is green, just in the ordinary sense of truth. Um, but what I'm suggesting is, is, well, there may not actually be an ordinary sense of truth. Uh, there's a whole bunch of truth-like concepts and ordinary talk of truth might just be indeterminate between all of these concepts, um, or maybe not all of them, but some of them at least. Um, so the ordinary sense, that, like ordinary talk of truth may just not determine whether or not grass is green, say, is really true. Um, in order to answer the question of whether or not it's really true, you'd have to first have some technical theory of truth. Uh, you'd have to say whether or not, like, OK, well, do you mean correspondence truth? Do you mean deflationary truth? And then if you mean correspondence truth, like, what's the standard? OK, do we have a high standard for a match or a low standard for a match? That's what you have to get on. You have to get that in place first. And then you can ask whether or not the proposition satisfies this standard. But, uh, but at that point, once you've presented that standard, that is a, a kind of technical philosophical notion that has departed quite significantly from um, just this like ordinary talk of truth. Um, so the idea may, so yeah, the idea is, okay, maybe truth is just sort of indeterminate. And so there's just gonna be no fact of the matter, um, whether or not various propositions are true or false. Um, and so a lot of these philosophical debates about like, well, you know, do we go for a kind of error theory about color? Do we say that it's, that color claims are useful falsehoods? Or do we go for a more realist view, like a naturalistic realist view, which captures some of our ordinary conception of color? And so color claims are really true. Um, there, there just is no, yeah, there is no fact of the matter. Um, it's just indeterminate. And uh, that, I think, is all I've got to talk about today. So thanks for watching. I will see you next time. Okay, goodbye, everybody.